Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Alvin Graylin. I am the China president for HTC. Uh, thanks, Chris, for inviting me to kick off uh, Gatherverse Asia. Uh, it's a real honor to uh, be helping um, spread the message here for uh, for the metaverse. Um, and uh, hopefully the next 15 minutes will be valuable to you in some way. So today we're going to talk about the open metaverse um, because I, I think it's very important that uh, if we're going to do the metaverse, we have to we have to do it right. And then having an open interoperable metaverse is really key to bring value to to our planet. Um, and you know, one thing I do want to remind everybody is that uh, the metaverse is not here yet. It's going to be some time before it gets here. Um, but we do, you know, it's very important what we do in the very near future so that it actually turns out well. Uh, you know, we're a very, very fortunate generation right now that, you know, pretty much all of the technology that we've been hearing about and reading about in sci-fi books and movies um, are all coming true at the exact same time. And the combination of all these technologies is really going to transform our lives. Uh, but today, you know, I'm going to focus more on uh, the middle one, which is the metaverse. Now, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have a little bit of a negative connotation for the metaverse because, you know, it's just really associated with sci-fi and pretty much all sci-fi books and movies are uh, dystopian novels. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's a good reason for that is because if uh, if they're if this, you know, too utopian, uh, they're just nothing exciting. There's no challenge. There's no there's no um, there's no villains. There's no bad guys. Right. Um, so the metaverse came from Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash. Um, I was able to uh, you know sit down with him for for lunch a, a couple months ago, and uh, we, we chatted about this. And he said the only the only book he knows or the only story he knows that is a utopian story is probably Star Trek. Uh, and, you know, even then they had them bad guys that were out of their, you know, normal uh, planetary systems. So uh, it's important that we, we do have, uh, you know, stories that are filled with, with you know, type of challenges and negativity. But it's important that we, uh, when we actually try to create the metaverse in the real world, that we do it so that it creates a utopian physical world, not a, not a shitty physical world that we want to escape to, escape from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because this has been such a popular term the last you know, year, year and a half, uh, there's been a lot of different definitions, a lot of people talking about it. So there's also a lot of misunderstanding. So I wanted to go through a few things that helps to create at least a common understanding of what is the metaverse first before we get started. So a lot of people will say, hey, the metaverse is just, you know, another name for VRAR, XR. Uh, VRAR is actually going to be one of the key interfaces for the metaverse, but it is definitely not the entire metaverse. A lot of people say, hey, the metaverse is just gaming and social. It's all about gaming. Um, no, actually, gaming and social is just you know, a couple of different use cases, but it could be used for anything from you know, medical to education to uh, collaboration, etc. Um, you know, some people will say, oh, it has to be about digital twin. It's just, a, a, you know, a, a virtual version of the physical world we're in. You know, wh why why would do we want to limit ourselves to the physical world when we can, you know, be and go to any any world we want to, right? Uh, some people will say, oh, and, you know, we're really worried about there's going to be escapism. Everybody's going to go into these worlds and never come out. Um, being someone who spends a lot of time in VR and XR, I can tell you uh, we're far away from having technology that will make you uh, wanting to to uh, escape to it for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say, you know, the, the metaverse is dystopian, it's going to make the world worse. Some people will say it's, it's totally utopian and you know, it's going to solve our problems. The reality is that it's, it's somewhere in between. Uh, you know, there's nothing, no extremes, and it's up to us kind of what we do in the next few years, which uh, part of that spectrum we, we land at. Some will say the metaverse is just a fad. It's just an, a niche. It's going to go away, you know, just like 3D TV did. Um, actually, no, because it is it's something that is part of a, a long term trend that's been with us for decades uh, called the Internet. <laughs> so it is really just the next generation of the Internet and, and the Internet is not going to go away. Um, some people will say it's already here. Some people will say it will never be here. Uh, neither of those are true. Uh, it's going to be a few years, probably somewhere in the five to ten year range. Uh, but when it gets here, it will be as important to us um, as the, the web internet is uh, today. 
and you know some people say you know i'm so and so company i'm making the metaverse or a, a metaverse um that actually is a misuse of the term um the metaverse is uh, not owned by anybody not should not be controlled and owned by anybody uh and it cannot be just like the internet today is not owned by any single company or person uh, some people will say it has to have, you know, virtual LAN and NFT. It's all part of the metaverse. Um, those are some use cases for Web3, but it's definitely not the metaverse. And Web3 itself, uh, people say has, you know, Web3 equals the metaverse. And and you know, the metaverse has to be decentralized. Um, actually, that's probably not true either. Uh, there will be parts of it that's decentralized, but it is not the entire thing. Um, <clears throat> So I told you what is not. So so what is it? Um, what 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 I found in my uh, I guess uh, experience is that you know if you want to define something, it has to be simple. It has to be something that people can remember. So this is my simple definition of what the metaverse is, and it is the 3D version of the internet that we've been building for the last several decades, powered by AI and interface to XR. Now, I, I realize in the next few years, there will be a lot of time when people actually are going to use 2D devices to interface uh, with the metaverse, you know, uh, worlds and technologies. Uh, but longer term, we're going to get to a point where, um, you know, AR uh, and, and VR and MR are going to be the main interfaces. Um, and, you know, why do I say 3D uh, is the key? Because if you look at how technology has evolved over the last, you know, 100 years or so, uh, at every technology transition, we're adding more dimensions, we're adding more interactions, and uh, we're adding more immersion. And, you know, XR is really the, 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 the kind of the destination of all this, where essentially we have full 3D worlds that are full, using full natural interfaces uh, with full immersion. Um, it really doesn't get much better than that. And, you know, it essentially takes us to where, uh, you know, we won't be able to distinguish a, a dream from the real world or a, a dream from the, the metaverse world. And, you know, why do I say it's powered by AI? Because if you look at uh, all the components that, that enable the metaverse or will enable the metaverse, uh, it, it all requires AI in, in the back, everything from the interface to the content creation, to the language translation, to the uh, the, 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 the positioning and slam, and even some of the, the search and discovery and monitoring in the background, all of that is gonna be powered by AI. Without AI, none of that is, is actually going to be possible. And, um, you know, this, this is going to be uh, a, a new way for us to to interface with technology. If you look at the last few decades, we've been trained on you know the mouse, the keyboard, the touchpad as our key interface to to digital uh, technology. What we're going is to use natural interfaces: our hands, our eyes, our our voice, our full body. Um, and and <clears throat> the more we do that, the more it enables accessibility for for all generations, for anybody, whether they're tech, tech savvy or not, they know how to use their hands, they know how to walk around, they know how to talk, and and that's how you're going to interface with uh, the future uh, devices that that will be part of the metaverse. And HTC has been playing a real important role in this space. In fact, you know, since the beginning uh, of this new wave of, of XR and, and, and AR, VR, um, you know, in 2015 or so, uh, HTC has been leading the way in terms of providing, taking to market the first, uh, you know, six off devices, the first standalone devices, the first thin and light devices, the first wireless PC VR, all of that was actually, uh, you know, brought to market first by HTC. And we continue to do so with our Vi Pro to businesses, our Vi Focus to, to the business mobile community, uh, and then the Vi Flow to the uh, more casual users, right? In fact, you know, we, we with these thin and light devices, uh, you know, we're essentially making uh, things that are so much more accessible. You're not having a box on your head anymore, and it, it makes people willing to wear this for much, much longer. Mm. Now, even at that, you know, kind of 180 gram uh, is still not enough. We, we actually just came out recently with a, a, a survey where uh, about 7,000 people replied in China. And for, you know, VR users, they seem to be okay with that kind of 100 to 200, you know, gram type of weight as an all-day device or everyday device. Uh, but for the uh, the non-VR users, the people who have been hesitating to get onto VR or AR, you know, they're really tending to kind of 100 grams and below. 
right? So, so we really still have a lot of work to uh, to do to get to satisfied uh, that class of customers, and that's where the real volume is. You know, at some point in the next few years, we're going to get to glasses that you know devices that look more like this, where you have a you know, single device that can do AR, can do VR, it's switchable, uh, and it's full, you know, and you're fully natural. Now, when we have devices like this, we're going to have people who wear it all day and every day. You know, we're, we're going to, you know, I, well, I want to make sure it's safe for everybody. So we actually did a study with the Communications University of China. And uh, after uh, 60 days, you know, using it four to five hours a day, uh, what we found was that users pretty much, uh, you know, didn't really have a negative impact on them. Uh, from their sleep patterns, and they pretty much were within, you know, 0.2 percent of the standard deviation or, or the average sleep patterns, uh, you know, no matter uh, throughout that entire period. Uh, we also found that their visual acuity didn't really change uh, throughout the entire period, and in fact, it might even have some positive impact in terms of health uh, for bringing a light amount of exercise. Essentially, uh, using VR, because it's something where you're standing and using your whole body and walking around, uh, it, it raises your heart rate to a light walking uh, type of heart rate. So it's kind of like walking for four or five hours a day, which uh, I think could do a lot of people a lot of good. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, you, you hear bantered around a lot of these trillion dollar values for, you know, what is the future value of the metaverse? Now, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, Bob Metcalf, he came up with Metcalf's Law, one of my professors at MIT, you know, he came up with the idea that the the value of a network is proportional to the square of the nodes, the square of the users, or square of the devices. Now, the, the metaverse is actually a little bit more complicated than the average network. So what is the value of the uh, the metaverse. So I came up with a little formula that I think might be helpful for us to guide us in terms of what we should be focusing on in the next few years to to really maximize that value. So, uh, you know, it's really about having it's proportional to the number of, of open worlds that you have, because more open worlds and more reasons people have to come, the more time they're going to spend in it. Uh, multiply times the the sum of the, the number of people using it on T, 2D devices, plus the square of number of people, people using it on XR devices, because the XR devices are going to give you more value. And you're going to make you stay longer. And you're going to enjoy it more, and you're going to create more relationships in there because you're actually interacting like you are in a physical world. And then all of that multiplied times the amount of time you actually spend in the world. Right. So if we can, you know, if we want to maximize this value, we have to get lots of worlds created, you know, millions and millions or hundreds of millions of worlds created and move people from 2D devices to to uh, XR devices to maximize that value and then getting them to spend more time in it. So if you listen to all the uh, investment banks, they're saying essentially, you know, somewhere between eight to thirteen trillion dollars in the next ten years will be created uh, in 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 this metaverse, um, I guess, uh, ecosystem. Right. So that's uh, it's a big number. It's a kind of uh, kind of it would be the it would be the second largest, the third largest country in the world uh, by GDP. Right now, how how is this going to happen over the next five ten years? I actually think that it's going to create it's going to be a four phase model, very much uh, like the the metamorphosis of the you know the the butterfly from eggs to larva to chrysalis to um, the adult butterfly. You know, we're starting out with a lot of these little fragile worlds that are all independent from each other, uh, and you know they could live or die, right? And you're going to have a few uh, that survive and, and become the larvas, a little bit bigger. Uh, these virtual world garden platforms um, that you know are still independent from each other, but they're they're more stable, providing more services. In between, we're going to create this chrysalis stage where the different regions, you know, Europe, China, US, they're going to wall off their users and create policies and regulation that uh, impacts in terms of you know, how their users will, will interact with each other and with other worlds. Uh, and then longer term, in kind of the five to 10 year period, we're going to get most of the world on the one common open metaverse where everybody can go anywhere uh, like they do today on, on, you know, on the Internet. And there will be some small pieces of it that are still walled off by regions. Right? I think that that's that's kind of the, the, the likely scenario of how this is going to play out. Now, there is something called the incomplete 
uh, metamorphosis that happens with locusts, uh, where they essentially become a bigger version. Uh, uh, they go from eggs to a, a little tiny locust, and then they become larger locusts. But they they look pretty much the same. Just one can fly, and one doesn't. But uh, they're they're not pretty, and uh, they they don't go through that kind of middle. <clears throat> chrysalis stage. So so I really hope that you know we we uh can move on the lower path where we go from something uh that is you know not as pretty into something that is really beautiful for for the world. Now what is going to happen in the next 10 years? Here's some of my predictions. I feel it's important that uh 3D content is going to become the primary data on the internet. Uh right now it's you know primary video. Uh, but we're going to transition to to 3D in the not too distant future. Uh, you know, devices are going to be very different. We're going to be more and more reliant on the device that's on our head because once you have that device on your head, you're not going to need to look at a screen in your pocket or on your desk anymore because you can virtualize any amount of screens you need. We're going to spend more of our waking time in the metaverse than we do in the physical world uh, without our glasses on, right? Or 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 without our, our you know glasses or headsets on. Um, so I think you know this is going to be a really really important part of our lives. You know we're going to go to school in it. We're going to you know go to work in it. We're going to socialize in it. Um, <clears throat> There will likely be more billionaires created in this metaverse than this than the internet has created over the last you know two or three decades. But at the same time, the world will become more egalitarian. People will be more equal because with a metaverse system, you have a much more borderless society. Anybody in the world, uh, you know, no matter where they're born, no matter who their parents are, they can get online and they can access a global economy. They can work for anyone in the world. They can be judged by their ability to create and imagine and and innovate, and not by you know what they're wearing or, or who you know where they were born, right? <clears throat> And uh, the the this virtual lifestyle, I think, is actually going to help one of our other major problems that we're all facing in, in, on this planet with the climate crisis. By having you know more virtual interactions, we're going to travel less, we're going to commute less, we're going to need to buy less things, uh, own less things, and uh, that's going to create less pressure on uh, this fragile Earth that we're on. And the the metaverse, I think, uh, the term the metaverse, when it actually becomes real, when it becomes mature, will likely not be called the metaverse anymore. I think that's something that is a little counterintuitive. Uh, just like you know, we used to say the the you know cyberspace or information superhighway. At the end, we still ended up with the internet, and I think the metaverse will probably just be called the internet or the three D internet. <clears throat> and lastly, I feel like. There's going to be hopefully a reduction in geopolitical conflict because as we spend more time in the metaverse, as we you know remove these ge geopolitical borders between us, we'll we'll be able to understand other people more, and we'll be able to, um, I guess, uh, remove some of the misunderstandings that are creating conflicts between us. So so we've done a study with the um, Chinese Academy of Sciences recently that I think is very hopeful. What we what they did was do essential uh, cultural education or cultural experiences through XR uh, or cultural travel, I guess they call it. Uh, and they found that uh, it, it gives 2x the shared experience as you would with you know video type uh, shared experiences. And what's more important is that it actually created a 130% increase in appreciation of the culture that they were talking about or learning about. And then lastly, it actually made people 71% more willing to travel physically to that place, meaning that they're going to, you know, uh, you know, understand these cultures better. They're going to want to go there more. And then, you know, by going there, you're going to understand, you know, meet people and 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 reduce the the um, the distrust that that ha comes with not knowing someone, right, or not knowing a culture. Now, the, the, the metaverse and, and all XR technology, in fact, all technology uh, is a two-edged sword. So, you know, it's important that, that we use it very responsibly. And, and, and you know, as an industry, uh, we, we don't abuse uh, what it can do. 
right? And uh, as our friendly Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. So how, how can we create an open and safe metaverse that's you know good for the world? Well, first of all, I think we need to realize that it should be a public good, just like roads and utilities and parks, you know, something that that we should all strive to to provide and protect. Right, and 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 be accessible to anyone. We we definitely need uh, cross world avatar systems, ID systems, wallet systems, payment systems, so that you know anybody anywhere in the world can 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 interact with the content and with each other. Uh, we're going to need better infrastructure for for networks and cloud compute, so that you know no matter what device you have on you, you can still have a good experience. And we're going to need better creation tools because if we're going to make those hundreds of millions of virtual worlds, we can't depend on the few million developers out there that are making you know games today. And we're going to need better data and ID and network security tools because we're going to be so much more dependent on this device, on, on these services than we are today. Even you know how dependent we are on phones today, we're going to be even more dependent on these devices in 10 years. And you know we're going to need to protect uh, the people and the data and and the, the children uh, on these um, on on these systems because. Uh, you know, the, the the influence of the technology is going to be immense and the ability for it to to create harm and to, um, uh, I guess, to to elicit crimes is also going to be in, uh, to be quite large. Uh, and so we're going to have to have a consistent legal framework that, you know, is defined and enforceable uh, globally. And we need to have alignments on all of these policies, as well as the infrastructure investments that's needed to create that that opt uh, optimal experience. And at the end of the day, uh, we're also going to need uh, interoperability, the interoperability standards, because for you know all these devices and all these contents to work together, we we have to have standards as we do today with with the telecom space, with the computing space. Um, you know, otherwise we're going to have we're going to be destined to have these little wall gardens, and then we we know that wall gardens are not good for the world. So HTC has been doing you know working hard to uh, you know provide the uh, a tool set called uh, the Viverse um, Metaverse Solution Set that will help to enable people to build and to experience um, the, the metaverse, even you know, kind of a primitive metaverse today, but hopefully more and more sophisticated over time. Um, you know, so I want to leave you kind of with one one uh, thought: is you know, let, let's let's leave a better verse uh, for for the next generation because. Uh, you know, one that's filled with butterflies and then not with locusts. <laughs> and, uh, one where, you know, we can go anywhere in the world and, and, and you know, be with anyone and understand every, anyone. So, uh, you know, at the end, uh, I think we, we can see the value of this metaverse. And uh, I really hope that we as an industry uh, come together to create that open, uh, interoperable metaverse that, that the world deserves. And uh, thanks again, Chris, for inviting me to speak uh, to your, your group here. And uh, let's uh, work together to uh, make this reality. Thanks, everyone.